Well, it's been a long 50 years. Sometimes hard for me to believe that uh, time has gone by so quickly. Aberfan has turned out to be the most important photo essay of my life. And strangely and oddly, I sort of felt that that was happening at the time. But let me go back. I've always been an artist, and I chose photography as an art because somehow unconsciously I knew that to provide my art, I had to be in the actual places where uh, the art could be made, as opposed to uh, thinking it up and going into a studio and painting or sitting at a, at a typewriter and writing. I had to actually go places, and uh, that was my calling. I struggled for a while as a young photographer, just out of uh, Ohio University. I was in a class in Ohio University that turned out to be rather unique. Colleagues of mine in school were all 35 millimeter camera photographers, as opposed to the rest of the crew there who used bigger cameras. We also all were enamored of W. Eugene Smith, who turns out now to be one of the greatest photographers of our time. His use of camera and light, black and white photography was outstanding. <laughs> one of my friends from school became his master printer, which was pretty good because uh, Smith himself was a man who wouldn't let anybody print his pictures. And so when he found James Corrales, we were all amazed. Before I go any further, I want to talk about what photography means to me and how important it is in a situation like a tragedy like Aberfan, where many people feel, leave us alone, don't take our picture, go away. This is the words of W. Eugene Smith that I live by as a photographer. Quote, each time I pressed the shutter release, it was a shouted condemnation hurled with the hope that the picture might survive through the years, with the hope that they might echo through the minds of men in the future, causing them caution and remembrance and realization. When I read this quote rather recently and realized it was my idol, Gene Smith, I knew that I had been onto something all my life. And that's what brought me to Aberfan. I was 29 years old, I'm married, I had a five-month-old son, I was living in New York, freelance photographer. I had just started getting assignments from Life magazine. They trusted me with a, an important assignment on Times Square to shoot the crime on Times Square that was supposed to be a two-day assignment, I turned it into a month, which of course was lucrative, but, but it showed them that I had, uh, um, there was more to my work than just going out and shooting pictures that I was thinking, thinking about the story, thinking about what was possible. The day that I saw the film about the Aberfan disaster, I was sitting with my five-month-old son on my lap, and it so impacted on me that I knew I had to do something about it. Gene Smith had been here in Wales just uh, 10 years earlier, and and I, I don't know if some of you may know his work and may know that he did this incredible set of pictures of uh, Welsh miners in the valleys. And of course, I remembered that. And so when I saw this, it, it was visceral. It meant something. I took myself down to Life magazine. I went to see the managing editor. And uh, I asked his assistant if I could get in to see him. And she said, you'll have to wait. And I waited an hour and a half in his outer office until finally she said, you can go in now. And I went in and Ralph Graves was sitting there. He knew who I was, but not too well. And he said, what is it? What's so important, Chuck? So I said, Aberfan. And he said, oh, Chuck, we're doing a cover story right now. Cover inside, you know, and made it seem as though I was really off base and was wasting my time. And I said, Ralph, I want to go there now. I want to go there after everybody leaves. I want to 
photograph what it's like to be in a town without children. Well, when I said that, he rocked back in his chair, put his hands behind his head, and he closed his eyes, and I could see that he was visualizing the potential story that I had just conjured up. And he called the editor of the Humanities Department of Life magazine, who would be responsible for a story of this type. The editor came in and he said, you know Chuck? Yes, I do. He said, Chuck wants to go to Aberfan and he wants to do a story of a town without children. And he said, that works for me. And he turned around and left. And I just sat at the edge of my chair. And Ralph said, uh, Chuck, go. And so I went. So I flew to London. I met the bureau chief of Life magazine, Jim Hicks, who eventually would write the story. Later, when you go outside on the wall, you'll see the whole story that was printed with my photos and Jim Hicks' story. And then we got in Jim's car and he drove us to Aberfan. We drove into the village on October 29th. Well, I can't tell you what an impression it made on me at the time. One thinks of Welsh mining villages as grimy and dirty, and, and that's exactly what I saw. I saw a town that was dirty, slurry all over the place. It was so depressing that I started to second-guess myself and say, what the hell am I doing here? And then we went looking around, stopped someone on the street and said, Where's it? is there a hotel in this town? And they said, yeah, go down to the Mac, the Macintosh. And so we did. I bring this picture up first because my photographer buddies here would appreciate it. This is an accidental photograph, but it's really a special picture. Just look at this kid. He's a survivor. Why is it accidental? You know, when you have a camera and you load the film in the camera, you pound off several frames to make sure you get onto a raw piece of film that wasn't exposed while loading. And uh, this was a frame that came accidentally as I was winding my film, loading my camera. I discovered it years later. This little boy is watching me do this. But this set the tone for what I was about to see. This is the Macintosh. It says Macintosh Hotel, but that was a misnomer, actually. When I went in, we wound up getting a room upstairs. That's the room at the top, the garret. Ironically, those windows faced out on the disaster site. That's Stanley Crow. He was the owner and publican. I took his picture right away before he had a chance to tell me, stop. <laughs> but I have to tell you something. We've all heard about the photographers and reporters who came into Aberfan during the story and what a bad taste some of them left. Well, he had this bad taste. And it, basically his attitude was, what the hell are you doing here? Get out. We asked him where we could stay. He was sending us up to Mirtha Tidwell. But fortunately, his wife, Pearl, she stopped and she said, wait a minute, these guys are Yanks. <laughs> we have a place upstairs if you want to sleep. We got two beds, there's no heat, but it's yours if you want it. And so we did. That's Jim Hicks, right there. He turned out to be a really good buddy. He's passed on now. I wish he was around so that I could tell him about this. Now here I am in that room. We went up to Merthyr and we bought boots. You see the Mac right here at the bottom? And uh, we bought over jackets and wools. This had no, we bought three heaters, electric heaters. We plugged them all in and blew the fuses in the whole place. <laughs> That's Moy Road looking straight up toward the disaster site. And you can't see the tips because they're sort of in the fog. That's just what the senior school looked like after the slide came down. So there I am in the room. Jim Hicks went back to London and left me alone. I sat there trying to figure out what kind of story I really wanted to do. I hadn't seen one child. Like in three days, I didn't see any kids. 
And I started to think, wait, well, maybe, I, maybe I wasn't making up a story. Maybe this really was a village without, without children. Look at this here. Whoop. That's my little desk with my wife and my baby. I smoke. That's my ashtray. That's one of my cameras. That's another camera here. There I am in the bathroom of the Macintosh, all dressed up, ready to go to work. So I wandered around. This is my first view of the disaster site. People just kept coming. It was parades of people just coming to look. That's the senior school, some guy looking in there. You know what I like about this picture, best of all, is, is this barrel over here. See that? I know it seems weird, but it sort of stands out and it's crushed. It has, it has a meaning. Looky-loos, people coming from out of, out of the village, checking out what happened. There's my first little kid I saw, standing there looking at where the school was, like, wow, there's the school. This was a coal delivery truck. I found out that the miners each were permitted uh, one bag of coal every week. And so this was the guy who did it. Here he is loading up the coal. Then I got up on the truck, and lo and behold, this little guy comes along. <laughs> that was a perfect picture for me. He had white hair and a white airplane, and turns out that's uh, Jeffrey Edwards is sitting right here. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time, but he was the first survivor I, would, I photographed. To me, it was just a kid on the street. This is Moy Road, right across the street from the Macintosh. This little girl was standing there, and to me, it's a very symbolic picture. Little girl survivor, Moy Road, senior school, tips. I tried to get the tips in as many pictures as I could. This turned out to be a grab shot. I walked past this playground and suddenly realized there's only one kid playing in this playground, all by himself. Look at him. I mean, that's like the saddest picture I've got. Now, this is Ronnie Davis. So I meet this kid, walking his dog. He's very nice. I talked to him about what had happened, where he was. He told me he, he he got out, he, he was rescued, or he got out, I don't know, I think he was in senior school. He lost his brother and uh, took me to where his house had been. So he's standing here in the side of his house. He and his family were living in a caravan up on the side of the hill by the cemetery. I took his picture. This, this is pretty emotional to me, this whole thing. He... Um, he had tremendous guilt. He wanted to know why his brother died and not him. He must have asked me that three or four times. I had to give him an answer. So I said, look, maybe God has a plan for you here on earth. You were saved. So what you have to do now, you have to live a really good life. Your brother would want that. Well. I didn't see Ronnie Davis for 40 years. And when I saw him 40 years later, I went into his house in Aberfan. His wife was there. And she came to me. She put her arms around me. She said, Ronnie Davis never talks about the disaster, but he talks about you. You know, every family we photographed, we visited on Christmas Day. And Jim and I, and my wife Mary, and his fiance, delivered Christmas presents to all these families from Life Magazine. Thank yous. We gave Ronnie Davis a tabletop soccer game. To tell you the truth, 40 years later, I didn't remember ever having given him that. But do you know that he went in the back room of his house and he came out with this game? in almost perfect condition. And he opened it up and he said, to him, I never forget you, he said, what you said. You told me to live a good life and I have. You know, this story had a tremendous effect on me. 
This is Cheryl Needs. This little girl is standing outside the <clears throat> temporary school where they set up so the kids could go to school and play and start to get back into life uh, normally. She refused to go in. Every day, she stood outside and cried. So finally, I decided to talk to her mother and asked if I could come and visit. And she, she said, okay. So I went and I met her dad. She would not leave her father's side. She was just devastated. She lost her brother and she almost died herself. Here she is on Christmas Day though, with this, uh, what we call the Victrola. Kids are all running home from the temporary school on Nixonville, and that's David Davis. So I followed him home. I met his dad. His name is Flu Davis, Flu Davis, who turned out to be sort of uh, one of the first guys on the scene of the, of the disaster, was digging, looking for his kid. In fact, according to the story I heard now, he approached Jeffrey, who was trapped. And he said, did you see David? And Jeffrey said he ran out. And so he went out looking for him and he couldn't find him. It turned out that David didn't run out. David was trapped in the slurry just like the others. And when he was dug out, they thought he was dead. He wasn't breathing. He was covered completely with, with mud and grime. And they carried him out and laid him down with the bodies. And a nurse came by with a doctor and they looked at him and they said, this boy's alive. And they picked him up and rushed him to the hospital. So here I was with him, and uh, that's his mom asking him to get dressed for me. I mean, you know, street play clothes. There he is. His family owned the farm just outside of Aberfan. And uh, so David took me on a tour of the farm. Here he is sitting there on this big tree and then in the field looking up toward the tip that almost killed him. And there he is 11 years ago in Aberystwyth when I had the exhibition. I'm happy I found these pictures so that I can connect some of these people to today from then. This is Sheila Lewis. This is the woman you saw in that film clip up here who talked about her daughter. So I'm wandering down the street, same street that I photographed David on, Nixonville, and these kids are coming back. She was looking for her son, Gwyn. That's him. That's him right there. I thought it was a really poignant photo. I took this picture and then I started to talk to her and we went inside the house and she said her daughter Sharon had died and that uh, she had written a poem. Sharon had gone to school because it was the last day of school for that term. She left her workbook home. So she had her workbook and she wrote a poem. I'm going to read you the poem that she wrote. Grief, it seems, may be our lot. Grief at times seems all we've got. I must not die and join her yet. My husband needs me. My children would fret. It's a simple poem, but it's meaningful. What I found meaningful was, I must not die and join her yet because this was the feeling that a lot of these people had. A lot of these mothers, especially. It's like they wanted to throw themselves into the grave with their kids. There's Sheila Lewis up in Aberystwyth 11 years ago, looking at these photographs. Then I went up in the meadows above the cemetery. Cemetery was a very special place and I hesitated to go to the cemetery because I knew that it was sacred ground and that it was a place I may not be welcome. So about a month after I was there, I went up in this meadow and saw these boys playing. And you could see people in the cemetery visiting below. I decided finally to go into the cemetery. I met a grave digger and his assistant. Then I saw this picture in the rain, a mother visiting a grave with the tips in the background, this little girl coming down the hill. 
this family, they buried her child in a separate place, not in the mass grave with the others. And then there are these very, very poignant photos of moms all coming up and visiting the graves. These high school girls came up. I don't know where they came from, but uh, they looks like they have uniforms on. Now this woman, I saw her maybe four or five times. She came every day. She told me she came actually twice a day. And she would mess around with the flowers, and then she looked at me one day, and she said, it's like I'm brushing her hair. Every morning, she said, every day. That's her sister with her two babies. This is probably one of the most tragic stories of all. John Collins. This man was working in Cardiff the day of the disaster. Got a phone call to come back. Terrible things have happened. So he came back up to Aberfan, only to find that his house was demolished and disappeared. And he looked around for his family and then eventually found out that his whole family would disappear as well. His oldest son, who was a high school boy in senior school, was sitting on a wall with a couple of friends when this avalanche of mud and rock came roaring down the hill. And the other two ran toward the school, but his son ran toward home. He wanted to warn his mom, but he got caught up in it and killed. And his mom was there in the house, and the house was destroyed, and she was killed. And his little brother was in Pantglass School, and he was killed. We went to see John Collins. I kept my camera hidden under my coat as we interviewed him. And I brought my camera out, and I looked at him, because I was really afraid to take his picture. And finally, he nodded to me, and I said, do you mind if I photograph you? And he said, oh, do your job, he said. He was terrific. This is in his father's house. So John says, I've got nothing left. No clothes, no pictures, nothing. It's like my life never existed. But you know, you know the old saying, life goes on. It does. So 2010, I got an email from a woman named Bernice Collins. And she says, Mr. Rappaport, you don't know me, but I'm John Collins' daughter from his second wife. I, you know, I wrote back, I said, wow, this is incredible. I didn't know he got married. She goes, yeah. She said, but you know, the really wonderful thing about it is that my mom, who was American, my mom saw your picture of John Collins in Life magazine and decided to go and see him. <laughs> My picture of John Collins turned this guy's life around. And it's all because he said, do your job. That's the power of photography. It's the power of journalism when it's really done right. OK, I have to admit, I lived over a pub. There wasn't much to do, you know. And so I came down every night and joined these guys. So I had several interesting experiences. First of all, the young miners, they thought I was an exotic guy from the Bronx. And so they befriended me. They taught me to play darts. They took my money. But after a while, I got well enough to take theirs. And that turned out to be very interesting because the last day I was in Abrafan on Christmas Day, I went to the pub to say goodbye to all my buddies. And they presented me with a set of darts and a handmade case so that I could go home and continue. And they asked me to come back because they wanted to get their money back. <laughs> but I digressed because look at this. Wherever I looked in the bar, there was always somebody who had what is referred to like the thousand yard stare, or you know, they just would suddenly fall into some sort of grieving moment that just would be fleeting. It may only last two seconds or five seconds. Something happened to them, flashbacks or a thought, and it would change their whole visage. This is interesting. You look, 
these guys are not happy with me being there. This was before I made friends with everybody. So it's like, what the hell is he doing here? Now this was the scariest part of my trip to Abravan. I took this picture of these guys, and the guy in the middle of that picture who's looking at me, he's not really smiling. He's not really happy to see me. His name is Di George. Di George from Merthyr. Okay, interesting story. Di George worked on a road crew for the council. What is it called? The council? The county? They were fixing the road right out in front of the MAC. When the slide happened, they literally, the crew of these guys, were literally the first people on the scene. They dug out somebody immediately who had come down in the slide, and just their arm was sticking out. Anyway, he's looking at me here. Moments after I took this picture, a few of my little young minor friends came over to me and they said, Chuck, you better get out of here. And I said, well, what's the matter? And they said, Die George over there wants to punch you out. I said, why? He said, I don't know. He said, I wouldn't ask, stop to ask. He said, just get out. He's the toughest guy in the valley. They took me into the parlor next door. And they told me, they said, you know, every, every year a carnival comes to the area. And in the carnival is a boxing ring. And the boxer has a promoter. And there's this guy who's a boxer, and he challenges anybody to last one round with this guy. And <laughs> you get 10 pounds if you can last one round. Die George has beaten that guy up every time <laughs> that the promoter won't let him in the ring anymore. <laughs> well, this is where I became the most courageous Chuck Rappaport of my life. <laughs> because I said to him, you know, I can't leave. I can't run. It's going to stop everything that I'm doing and I'll lose face with everybody in the bar. I have to go and make friends with him. And so I went back out. I brought him over a pint, and I sat the, the pint down. I wanted to sit down on a chair, and he, he, he wouldn't, ex wouldn't allow me. And he cursed me out with every curse word in the book, and again told me to leave. And I told him that I was not what he thought I was. I said, I'm not a reporter. I'm not here for t doing a story like the other guys did. I said, I'm a poet with a camera. Well, he looked at me and said, you hear him? He's a poet. <laughs> he said, what do you know about poetry? And then another guy said, you know, this is a land of poets. So I said, I know. I said, I know it is. Well, if you know poetry, they say something in Save some poetry for us. Well, thank God for Ohio University English course. <laughs> Dylan Thomas. So I looked at them and I said, Now as I was young and easy under the apple bough about the lilting house and happy as the grass was green, the night above the dingle starry, suddenly another guy in the bar finishes what I'm saying. <laughs> that was it. That's all it took. So Di George told me to sit down. We drank, and then he looked at me and he said, Chuck, if anybody gives you any trouble, <laughs> you tell him Di George is your body god. And that was my Di George story. Di George was nice enough to take me up to Merthyr to a dance. He said, you're going to love this dance. So we go up there, I walk into a room, and there are 25 women sitting on one side of the room and 25 men sitting on the other, and they're all getting drunk. And I'm sitting there saying, why doesn't anybody dance? <laughs> he says, they will later. But I told him, you better take me back. To... So this is, uh, I think his name is John Davis. John Davis's son, Paul, was killed in the school. It was his only son, and a According to what I found out, Paul would come from school, pick up his dad, and take him home every day from school. Now, no Paul. So John just sat there till closing time. It was pretty sad. These are my dark buddies. 
What I love about some of these guys is they got dressed up to come to the pub. Now, this is the other man in Die George's crew. So he worked all day on the pile. I was told that he and Die George dug and dug and dug, and then more people came, and the miners came, and the trucks came, and the firemen came. But these guys were there from the moment the slide happened until they could no longer lift their arms. And this man, unlike Di George, who was able to sit, drink, and communicate, this man got drunk every night. And he got up and he danced. You know what he's dancing to here, I can tell you. It's not unusual to be sad with anyone. Tom Jones. You know, about 10 times I was told by these guys, you know, Tom Jones, he comes from Pontypri, right down the road here. He used to come here to the conservative club and sing all the time. <laughs> I brought a copy of Life magazine with me, the one that uh, Ralph Graves said that they were putting together, and I showed it to the men in the, and they really liked it. This, this was a great picture. I love this picture. Because the pub looked out on the disaster site, these guys would go up to the window and stare out there. Look at this guy's face. He's an old miner retired. While he's looking out there, he's saying to me, I dug that, what do they call it, the waste, you know? I dug it, he said. I put it up there. I did. Talk about guilt. These miners had a lot of guilt. That's that thousand yard stare I talk about. Then they started to want my, to me to take their pictures. Take my picture, Chuck, he said. Take my picture. You can see they had a few drinks. Life started to change. I was there six weeks, so by the sixth week, that's the publican in Pearl, Stan in Pearl, dancing. Then I went up, decided to go over to the mine and check out the miners. Here they are coming up one mile deep. They were, Jim Hicks and I went down that was the scariest time of my, I'll tell you. You can't take pictures when you're down there. It's like pitch black, so. Then I went and visited the site again. I decided to go up to the top of the tip number seven. So here I am with the guys who were there when it happened. See the rail here? This is rail was broken. This is exactly the place where the tip separated and fell. And this guy was telling me how he was there with a group of people, and they actually saw the tip break away and fall down. They saw it going down. They never thought it would reach the village, but it did. That's what it looked like, to give you some perspective. That's the Mac right there, the hotel. That's my room up there. This, I thought, was the first bride after the disaster. I've subsequently learned that there was another wedding a day after the disaster, which we won't talk about because it's so weird. Um, but this is uh, Denise Hughes, or Denny. So I got permission to photograph the wedding, which was a good deal for them because Life Magazine gave them a beautiful photo album of my pictures. But I went to the house when she was getting ready. Look at this picture of this woman sitting there contemplating the happiest day of her life just a month and a half after the disaster. This is uh, Reverend Hayes, Ken Hayes. He turned out to be a hero because he went up to the disaster site and it was chaotic. And it turned out that he took over, he took charge. Somebody had to take charge, he took charge. He lost his son too when this all was going on. And here he is conducting the wedding small wedding in his church. Actually, it wasn't the church of these people because their church was, had been messed up by the mortuary business. You know, you gotta take a look at this woman's face, when she, this bride looking at her. I don't know if you can see it, but it's almost like she's saying, yeah, you're gonna be good forever, right? <laughs> Here they are out there, ready to go on their honeymoon. This is a really good shot. I got everything I needed, including the tips. There they are, 40 years later. Unfortunately, the husband died a couple of years ago. Gerwin is his name. 
And I'm going to see Denny, Denise, I'm going to see her on Monday. Then we had the first child born in Aberfan after the disaster. I asked around the pub and I said, does anybody know of any babies that are being born? In and they, they put me on to these people, which was one of the greatest coincidences of a photographer's life. Why? Because they lived on Cottrell Street and Cottrell Street was parallel to the uh, Aberfan Road and parallel to the road that looks up on the disaster. Now, look through the curtain window and you can see the street that goes all the way up to the tips. You'll see this in the Life magazine spread. They said, in the shadow of the tips, new life is born. That's the street. And there's a boy, I think his name is Phil Reese. He's playing by himself. That's one of the things I noticed when I was there. Kids playing by themselves. This is kind of like the payoff that life goes on. These are the kids outside the temporary school. They saw I was taking pictures, so they all rushed me to get their picture taken. And uh, I obliged. That's me in Aberfan, 29 years old, in some ways not knowing what the hell I was doing. But somehow my photographic skills saw me through. There are times now, I even said to my wife the other day, I don't know, I had the guts to do this the courage, you know, to go and do this and not, not think that I would fail. Because I very easily could have failed, but I didn't. Life magazine was really happy with what I did. So um, that's the end of the pictures, but I just want to say, to take, finish this off, my philosophical takeaway from having asked for this assignment and having been sent into that emotional turmoil and the utter feeling of grief and hopelessness. I did not return to Aberfan until 2003, and the village looked entirely different. It was all green, and there were flower pots outside every window. The town looked like a beautiful little town, nothing like I had imagined or remembered. And I'm going to leave you with one quote from Martin Rubin. Morning will come. It has no choice. Thank you.